ladies and gentlemen, gentle people of Google, let's be honest. We know you don't like journalists, but that's really, that's a low blow. Putting three journalists on after the mysticist, <laughs> the mentalist. But you know what? He asked who was skeptical in the room. We're the most skeptical people in the business, so we know what you're up to. Mathematician, mysticism, mentalist, merde. That, as Lior would have told you, is a four-letter word, so I'm not going to say it in English. But never mind that. We know that he can create lots of things, but you know what, we talk to all of you guys, and that's how we know what you're thinking. My name is Lise Doucette. I work for the BBC, and I'm Canadian, which means I'm one of those people that Frank told us this morning are the only country in the world which trusts the government. And even more importantly, I have doubled the population of Canadians here at the Google conference. Are you the other Canadian here? With the boyfriend, Jun Sung, are you Canadian? One more Canadian, so we've doubled the population of Canadians here. But before we were totally blown away by the powers of Lior, what were we thinking about today? We were thinking about the battle between good and bad. We heard about it all day today, whether it comes to democracy, computer viruses, or artificial intelligence. And Kai Lifung told us in the last session, he said, well, yes, the bad is getting stronger, but good wins most of the time. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's the battle for journalism. And we too say that we live in the best of times and the worst of times. The best because of the dazzling power of technology that's given us new powers and new platforms. But technology and politics is disruptive, devastating, and dangerous. Good people of Google, journalism is in nothing less than an existential crisis. You know there's an F word that we sometimes use, not in polite company like Google, of course, but there's another F word of our time, fake news. How can we have good journalism in an era of fake news? That is the topic of our next, of our next panel. And in the battle against, the battle for good journalism, we have some secret and not so secret weapons. And that is the best of journalists. Please join me on stage, two of the best in the business. Catherine Viner and also Lydia Polgram. Please give them, come on, give them a welcome. They, too, have magical powers. <laughs> Catherine Viner is the editor-in-chief of The Guardian. She was also the deputy editor. She launched Gar The Guardian in Australia, and what a success it was. She launched The Guardian in New York as well, another success. So she's a Guardian lifer. Lydia Polgreen, however, has switched, switched loyalties <laughs> midstream. She used to be the editorial director of New York Times Global. I'm sure many people here read it. She was also the West Africa Bureau Chief, but now she's the editor-in-chief of Huffington Post. Welcome to both of you. Lydia, Thank you. if it is a new era, how do you define this new era or system? How do you see it? Um, I, I mean, I tend to think in systems, and I like to pull really far back to think about the era and time in which we're living. And um, we have a lot of conversations about sustainability, and usually we're talking about the environment. And I actually think that journalism is facing a crisis um, that is something akin to the climate crisis that we're facing, except for instead of ordinary earthbound ecosystems, it involves our information ecosystem. Um, this, this, this crisis is really unprecedented and it um, threatens the sustainability of free societies all over the world. If I look at my own country, we've seen a 55% decline in the number of working journalists uh, since the year 2000. Uh, over the last 15 years, 1,400 newspapers have closed um, and uh, that has left um, incredible numbers of small cities, um, even large cities with one or, or no newspapers at all. So we're living in a world in which um, 
And, it's, and, and, and the reason that I think it's like, like climate change is that the Industrial Revolution produced all kinds of growth and amazing um, progress for humanity, um, but it also left us with a broken planet. Um, and I think that the Digital Revolution has brought lots of amazing growth and our, our profession has um, really thrived in terms of being able to spread the journalism much more easily than we used to. But um, we also have a huge problem of information pollution. And uh, fake news is, is, is just one part of that. So, so I think we're really facing a systemic crisis. And that crisis extends also to our ability to monetize the work that we do. A lot of issues in there. But let's, let's look at it. Catherine Bryan, you're, you're part of the fight back. How do you fight back? <laughs> Well, I think you have to fight back on lots of different levels and in lots of ways. Now, you mentioned at the end, Lydia, about the it's a business crisis as much as a crisis of the business model. Yep. And one of the things we tried to, at the Guardian, to do at The Guardian is, is find a sustainable business model, which we've done by going to our readers. And I think that's a lot of how we uh, should be sustainable in the general ways and how we should respond to these crises. Because these crises aren't just a crisis of journalism. There are crises on all different sorts of levels that are affecting our societies and our cultures, you know, whether that's climate change and the impact of technology. Technology. It's the national disruption we've been uh, talking about this morning. It's the local disruption where people are sort of alienated from their communities. Or it's the sort of uh, personal disruption with such terrible rates of depression and loneliness and so on. So I think, you know, journalists have to respond to that and within that as citizens and as well as journalists. So with The Guardian, we've come up with um, five ways to do that. I mean, I think... Lots of journalists are sort of saying, well, then we'll go to facts. If, if uh, Trump in particular is constantly attacking facts, then we must go to the facts. And absolutely, we should. You know, without facts, journalists are nothing. There is no journalism without facts. But I think one thing that's been very clear over the last few years is that that's not enough. Facts alone are not enough, and it has to be something more than that. Um, it can't just be describing the kind of terrible situation and uh, leaving our readers very bleak. Uh, so I think you respond on five different, in five different ways. Um, one of them is that you uh, don't just critique the world and sort of have a whale of pain about what you see. You also bring new alternatives, fresh ideas, how to do things differently. I think you have to collaborate. I mentioned the way The Guardian's done that with our readers in reinventing our business model so that we've... I just have to get this in. We had our first profit for 20 years this year. Um, thank you. <laughs> I, would, I do try and get a little round of applause for that every time I say it. Um, but it's also collaborating with other news org organisations and accepting that the public interest is bigger than any one individual news organisation's interest. I think we need to be much more diverse to represent the societies we report on. Um, otherwise, we're going to be uh, alien and in some weird separate bubble. Uh, we need to be meaningful. I think... Um, the, the way the digital revolution has impacted on a lot of journalistic organisations has led them to doing kind of mass clickbait, uh, misrepresenting stories, doing headlines that don't tell the truth, um, and then not making phone calls, just churning out, look, there's this phrase, journalism, not journalism. Um, and I think you ha we have to step back from that and do something meaningful. And the way you do that, and that's the fifth principle, is that you report fairly on people as well as power. Reporting is the main thing that journalists do that is very hard for other people to do because it's so labour-intensive um, and so difficult and complicated. Um, and while the world is a awash with opinions and, and uh, made-up stuff, we can report, we can go on the ground, and we rep can report both on the powerful and the impact on people that those decisions that powerful people make have. So I think, but it's a very, very serious uh, mm. issue. And, and uh, you know, we put it, the, the, the way I'd summarise it is you'd use clarity and imagination, clarity to report the facts, imagination to bring fresh new ideas, and that then builds, ho builds hope in what is a quite a hopeless time otherwise. Mission statement. So reporting is what we do. We do stories, not just content. So, but what we do is all about what you do. So let's, let's be, look inside first and see how, what we can do better. And then we'll look at what perhaps you can all do better. Lydia, mm. you moved from the New York Times to the Huffington Post, which may have been a shift in other ways as well. Let's talk about the bubble. Kath has already talked about the kind of reporting we do. What have we learned in this crisis? Well, I mean, part of the reason that I, that I, that I made the switch was that I saw um, the crisis in inequality that we're seeing the world over playing out in journalism. Um, and increasingly, you have a handful of news organizations that compete uh, for the time and attention and money of the people who frankly need the journalism the least. They're spoiled for choice. Um, they are 
in general, extremely well-educated, they're quite wealthy, um, they seek out news and therefore likely to be extremely informed. Um, and uh, you know, when, when I worked at the New York Times, you would often say, what, you know, what, what is the primary characteristic of a New York Times subscriber? And that was sort of a holy grail to figure out. And it's not just that they're wealthy, although that helps, um, but really it was that they were curious. Um, and uh, after the 2016 election, I remember sort of sitting bolt upright and thinking to myself, well, what about the incurious? And aren't those the people who actually most, most desperately need to be informed? And the vector through which those people had once been informed was often through local news. And there's been this tremendous collapse in local news, as I was saying earlier. Um, you know, you switch on your local television news to figure out what's going on with the traffic, and then in the middle you'll see a report about, um, you know, the mayor and the, um, you know, whoever it is that's um, the corrupt cop that was just, uh, just brought down and busted. All of that ecosystem created, all of that created an ecosystem that engendered a certain amount of trust and confidence in the community. And what you've seen is in um, places where, uh, where there's been a reduction in local reporting, you have uh, lower voter turnout, lower voter participation, you have fewer candidates standing for public office. So of course, I didn't think all of this just immediately right off the top of my head when I made the decision that I was gonna make this switch. But I think very much in the back of my mind was this idea that um, it's an unhealthy world where it's a kind of winner take all. And if you only have you know, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and a handful of cable news organizations, and with this shift towards, towards uh, consumer revenue, meaning subscriptions and, and, and paywalls, um, I was deeply concerned about the notion that high quality news would essentially only be available to those who could pay for it. Um, and so uh, it felt like a great time to make a giant leap and take this extraordinary global platform and um, think about what it would mean to be a news organization that uh, put people before power and um, saw its audience as being um, those who are experience, experiencing the sharp end of these great global trends that we've been talking about, whether it's globalization or technological change. Um, and you know, I, I, I like to think of HuffPost as being sort of um, progressive populist um, mm -hmm. in its stance, um, slightly pugilistic, um, never shy about having a point of view. Um, and I think, I think the world needs more voices. We need a greater plurality of voices um, in order to um, have a well-informed citizenry that supports the kinds of open societies that we wanna have. I do think so, there's something really hmm. interesting about those people who are excluded from hmm. news, from good quality news. And I think it contributes to these uh, votes for Brexit and Trump, this sort of feeling of people being invisible. Just give you one story around that. We made um, Stoke, which people from Britain will know was labelled the Brexit capital of Britain. And they were really pissed off about being labelled the Brexit capital of Britain. So we went there and we spent several months building up this amazing digital series about Stoke. And then we did an event there. And at the event, the people who run events in Stoke said that they'd seen people coming to this event who had never, ever, ever come to any public event in Stoke mm. before, you know, because this series had reached them in a way that normally journalism never reaches those kinds of people. And they're the people who desperately need this kind of information. Yes, but you use a word which in the world in which you live has become a valuated word, the, you know, high quality journalism. One person's BBC is another person's Fox TV. Lydia used the word trust. We've heard about truth. Let's look at two other T's, technology and tech giants. <laughs> How much do those people in control of technology, what is their role in the battle for better news, for the truth and for the end of fake news? I mean, obviously, because the way so many readers encounter our journalism is through technology. Um, the vast majority of the Guardian's audience comes for, um, through the social uh, uh, media platforms and from, and from Google. Um, that um, they are the gateway to information. And I think um, the fact that it uh, can often be so hard to find the good quality, transparently funded news on platforms, uh, that, that it looks the same as uh, stuff that's been made up or stuff that's been put there for political reasons or ideological reasons or commercial reasons um, is a problem. I mean, obviously, it's, um, it's a huge role for these organisations to play. Lydia, back to that theme we've been hearing time and again, today in the zeitgeist, the battle between the bad and, and the good on the, all of these new technologies and, and progress we've had. When it comes to technology, is it becoming more of a force for good or for bad? I mean, I think it's a, it's, it just depends on, on, on the motives of those using it. Um, but I think it cannot be a good thing that, um, 
it was not a good thing that there were so many elite gatekeepers um, to information um, before the internet. Um, mm -hmm. I think that was not good for society. Um, but I think that the total absence of gatekeepers and the total absence of rules of the road has been incredibly destructive. Um, you know, I think that uh, the role of social media, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, um, in um, radicalizing people, whether it's you know uh, terrorists in the Middle East or you know young people feeling alienated mm -hmm. who become ter terrorists here in the United States, or um, white supremacist terrorists in um, in 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 places across uh, the world. So I, I mean, I think, I think it's, it's very clear that uh, technology brings an amazing um, bounty of riches to the practice of journalism. It brings us huge audiences. Um, but I think it also brings extraordinary risk. And um, I think it's well past time that we thought about a real and robust way to, um, to, to, to rein in um, the, the, this kind of Wild West, and mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's been incredibly destructive. How many how many here was how many here are worried about fake news? Put up your hands. How many of you here are worried? And how many of you here in this room believe that between you and us, we can somehow win in this battle to fight against fake news? Okay, that's that's I think that's I good. Think we, we so you have yes, a so we have yeah. collective interest yes. in making it work. You know, mm, we're yeah. all citizens in whatever jobs we do. Yes. We're citizens in our societies, and so we, you know, and, and if we understand the role of good information in a democracy, then we all have an interest in making that work. And I think it's about time we all work together to do that. Really, mm. because it was quite fascinating what we saw in the artificial. Um, uh, artificial intelligence session where people, of course, are worried about using technology to impose faces, to impose voices. The Barack Obama one is the one you all know. This is a frightening time for our industry because fake news is one thing, but when a video looks as though it's the real mm. thing, I think these are these must mm. be challenges you're mm. already yes. confronting. No, in fact, the Guardian is investing in a company that um, goes into that uh, can uh, isolate deep fakes. But I was intrigued that Demis said that that should be owned by the government. Yeah. Uh, that which was very interesting. It would make yes. me slightly nervous, the idea that the deep... I mean, certainly in the US, I'm not sure I want the US government owning the deep... Owning the deep fake detection. Company right now, right. you know. But um, so I think uh, it's, it's, it's such a troubling area, but something we just have to face collectively very urgently. But at the same time, I mean, I think, I think it's, 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 it's worth... And in all of the conversations around regulation, um, it, we should all be suspicious that Mark Zuckerberg is begging to be regulated. Um, <laughs> the history of regulation um, is almost um, entirely... Um, about entrenching uh, incumbents. And so uh, by heavily regulating social media platforms now, I think we're essentially making sure that the new social media network that is maybe, maybe uh, uh, better on privacy or better on, um, on, on reducing uh, the spread of hate and things like that is gonna have that much of a harder time um, getting forward. I will say that you know, I, I, was a, I was a kind of OG enthusiast um, of, uh, of social media. I started using social media when uh, I was a young foreign correspondent in West Africa. I grew up in, in, in East and West Africa in a highly information starved environment. Um, mm. You know, we had state TV and we had state newspapers, um, and that was basically it. And the idea of being a young journalist um, in the middle of West Africa, able to connect directly with the people I was writing about, was incredibly powerful and created transparency in a way that 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 was unthinkable for um, for a journalist who'd been working at the time when I was a child, in the um, in the early. 90s. Um, but I, I, what I take from that, there, there are a couple of little things on the internet, or not so little things on the internet, that I think give us a glimpse of how we can have things that are open yet accountable. Um, and, and, and one example that people don't talk about enough is, um, is Wikipedia. Um, I think if anything comes the closest to embodying what all of us hoped the internet might be, it's you know nonprofit, it's self-policing, um, you know it's run by a community, um, it's it's not elite. Um, so I, I take that as a kind of inspiration, and I think that the worry that I have is that if we essentially take the status quo and freeze it through regulation and say, okay, these big companies are allowed to exist, but. Um, but um, new entrants are going to have this barrier. Uh, we, we may actually miss out on the thing that might be more accountable and better for um, open societies. Mm. 
if I was Lior Suchard, I would say that all these people out here, Kath, are waiting to hear from you as to what you think is the solution to this. To I leave thought you were going to say one. who my first yes. boyfriend was. So, yes. <laughs> Why would you want to know? I think he's here, so I wouldn't want to embarrass him. So, but um, if you if you had to, yeah. in the bag, you know, we hear about changing the algorithm. We hear about greater awareness. We hear about reading widely. What are, if you could just say one thing, right. put one thing on your Leo yeah. social board, what would you say? <laughs> Um, I guess it's just that at all levels, um, if the uh, big technology companies need, uh, can recognise that news organisations that are transparently funded and based in facts um, uh, uh, need to be sort of prioritised and treated differently from Walmart or a soap company. We do something different for society, for democracy, and we have a collective interest in that working out. And I would just add that um, it's not just um, it's not just the big technology platforms. I, in my capacity as, as, as editor and general manager, spend a lot of time talking to advertisers. Um, they're the ones who've <laughs> taken their money and given it to Facebook and Google. And um, you know, I started out talking about climate change, so I'll, I'll close with it. And so I often will say to, to CEOs and CMOs of big brands, and I'll say, look, you put a lot of money into sustainability because you see it as a massive business risk. Um, I see the, um, the, 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 unsustain uh, the insustainability of our current information ecosystem as a massive business risk for every company in the world. And stable societies require stable sources of information. So, I, I, you know, reader revenue is great, but I think that brands should really be thinking about how they're spending money, and they should spend it with high quality media companies like The Guardian <laughs> and HuffPost. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, you got yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> ladies, and, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I really hope that in this 20 minutes you weren't thinking about your first boyfriend or girlfriend. <laughs> I was thinking about mine. I yeah. hope you were thinking about the fact that you have before you two of the leading editors in the battle for what is a battle of all of a certain time, one of the key pillars of the democracies we hold so dear, the battle for good journalism. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Catherine Viner thank and Lydia Paul Green. Thank you.